<clears throat> That's right. The dream team. Trouble is here. And we are live discussing the Dead Sea Scrolls with a Dead Sea Scroll scholar. And of course, the question today will be why? Why are the Dead Sea Scrolls so important? And we'll be taking questions, of course, from our audience, but also diving into this deep. Did you want to comment on that? Yeah, no. Uh, live from the Myth Vision Studio in in person. He's not a phantom. I'm not a phantom. Docetism is, is false. Physical resurrection. Um, and we will we will discuss the Dead Sea Scrolls. We will discuss what what. Uh, even scholars are still getting wrong about them. And we will discuss my harrowing journey to get here. Stay tuned. Back in Washington, Kip Davis is getting his first look at a final prized fragment in the Museum of the Bible's collection. This is a fragment that contains text from Genesis chapter 32, and it's supposedly from the first century BC or the first century CE. All right. That was my that's my favorite intro on Myth Vision, the way that I produced it's it. It's mine too. It so, is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, until you get your matrix one up and running. That's right? true. It's yeah. yeah but the fire, the fire's coming, people. You know, the to fire's stay coming. Tuned yeah, that. you're gonna have to. You're gonna have to. I always enjoy <sighs> that. Um, you were actually working on the what were you working on in that in that production? That was um, that was all filmed at the Museum of the Bible, um, and at, that's all from the uh, the Nova documentary Dead Sea Scrolls Detectives. And I was working on the fragments that that uh, the Museum of the Bible owns. So they have uh, sixteen individual fragments. They're all forgeries. Um, and that was part of the part of the purpose of the documentary. And part of the reason I was there um, was because up to that point, I had not, I mean, I had I had worked with the photographs and I worked with the the literature and a bunch of the other uh, stuff that was that was kicking around. Um, so I, I I knew enough at that point to 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 strongly suspect that these were forgeries. So it mm. took, it took a trip out to Washington DC to do like a, like a physical 
examination in person. And then while I was there, the, uh, the documentary company, uh, contacted me and they're like, Hey, can we just come and, uh, film while you're there? That's so awesome. it was, it was pretty cool. It that was pretty is. cool. And I was very, I was, I was, uh, very happy that, um, uh, I, I got to wear my black Calgary flames t-shirt and they didn't, they didn't have to, to smudge out or do anything with the images. Yeah. So he told me the, uh, the director said that if I was a Yankees fan, he said, I probably would have had to, <laughs> I probably would have had to change because apparently the New York name, the, the New York Yankees, like they've got bots scouring social media and, and you can't everything. No, 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 no. They'll, uh, they'll, they'll ding you. That's weird with, uh, with a copyright mm. infraction. So, well, it's good to meet you, Derek. Yeah, finally <laughs> in finally. person. Um, we're gonna hang out with you for a little bit. He just got in. He, we're gonna talk about his trip too. In case you guys want to ask any questions, <laughs> we'll we will derail to your super chats to discuss it. Doctor Kip Davis, if you're new to him, he is a Dead Sea Scroll scholar. To put it in another way, he's a biblical scholar. And we're going to discuss that we'll as well. That, um, yeah. This is something that I find quite ironic, especially with what I do on Myth Vision. By the way, do I need to scoot this so that you're not like hanging off of the... Is that better? Yeah, maybe. That's a little better. I think that's better. Out of your way. Okay, that's cool. That's good. Thank you. Um, so um, for those who are tuning in, be sure to subscribe to his YouTube channel. I did pin it to the top. He discusses Dead Sea Scrolls, obviously biblical stuff. He does anti-apologetic work because he finds that much of the work there is, just to be frank, dishonest with the material. Uh, is that a fair assessment? Not everybody, I'm not saying everyone's motives are, but there's like this agenda, right? Oh, yeah. So yeah. you're really and dealing with that. Yeah. So, um, sorry, I tuned out for a second. Are we Go talking ahead. about the, are we talking about the series yet? Well, I was just the, pointing out oh, your, yeah, yeah. your YouTube channel. Okay, so, like, and that's something, I mean, some one of the things that I, I get into a fair bit in my series is, um, my new series on the Dead Sea Scrolls, is that uh, they have been a, um, um, a, a tremendously useful tool um, for Christian apologists, in large part because they're so old. And because there's so many of them that you can, you know, there, there's narratives that you can construct from the material when you're selective about it. And uh, so for, for Christian apologists, it's easy to construct uh, narratives out of us, out of the select material that, that they, they uh, focus in on to say things about uh, the Bible that may not necessarily be accurate, but they're not the only ones. Right. Um, like one of the things that, and I'll, I'll get into this a little bit more in the series. Uh, it's really one of the really interesting things about the history of the discovery of the, oh, I thought I turned that off. Sorry. Uh, the history of the discovery <laughs> of the Dead Sea Scrolls is that, uh, it's that, obnoxious pat lavender who is that i don't guy? know what he's doing but so the history pat. of the discovery of the dead sea scrolls <laughs> is quite fascinating because it it happened right at this this turning point mm -hmm. in history in 1947 when the scrolls were were found by uh the tahamida bedouin uh and first purchased by um, the Metropolitan, Mar Athanasius Samuel, as well as Eliezer Sukenik, the professor of archaeology at the Hebrew University. This literally happened right at the end of the British mandate for Palestine. Mm. And right at the time when Israel declared nationhood. Right. So what has happened... Uh, since the time of their discovery is someone like, well, the state of Israel um, has used the scrolls themselves to make, justify, bolster their claims of their, nationalism. Yeah, and, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. 
And it's uh, and Christians, you know, they eat that up with the whole 88 reasons the Lord's coming back in 1988 yeah. and stuff. And it's 40 years after this time period when they discover them. So there was that was actually one of the justified reasons a lot of Christian evangelicals were like, hey, Jesus is coming back in 1988. Yeah, yeah. It's been 40 years since we discovered the sacred text and somehow that helps. And then they go even further. Right. And like, oh, well, since it didn't happen in 88, it's double generation. So it's actually 80 years after the discovery. Oh, yeah, and like, man. you know. So the um so I, the um I'll just say this one more thing this this one thing the um the six day war, which was and I should know this off heart but I'm sorry I'm I'm really literally only had like two hours sleep in the last thirty seven yeah. so he's been on a uh, journey <laughs> let's put it that way to um, get here <laughs> so the six day war um. W- what happened was was Israel managed to to annex and and occupy all sorts of uh, of new territory, um, most of which they 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 still hold. Um, importantly, part of which was um, on the West Bank there when uh, when the Pal- when when the British mandate ended and uh, the state of Israel. Uh, was declared after after lots of of uh, armed tension, I guess, in the region mm-hmm. in 1947. The dividing line actually had all of the all of the scrolls that scholars were working on in Jordan. So the Palestinian Archaeological Museum was where all the scrolls were housed, and that was still part of Jordan. Right. in East Jerusalem. And then after the Six Day War, that was that was a big part of uh a big big part of uh what what Israel thank you 1967. That's a big part of what Israel uh annexed and along with it all the Dead Sea Scrolls that were you know basically Jordanian national property at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh Jordan still has scrolls. Uh, and there's there's interesting stories about that. Uh, there aren't any scholars who have seen the scrolls that are in Jordan for over, it's got to be 30, 40 years now. Wow. And uh, like I know the people, um, my one of my mentors, Marty Abeg, is the current uh, editor-in-chief of the new series, of editions it's called Dead Sea Scrolls editions it's being published by Brill um and uh one of uh, his co-editors is uh Allison Schofield who's been doing the work on uh the community rule from uh Cave 1 I think it's I think it's the community rule from Cave 1 yeah that makes sense but uh a lot of that material uh is still in Jordan and hmm. she has been you know, working like crazy to get into Jordan to go look at this stuff. And it's I hope it frees up. I mean, there's always so much there's there's things that I stuff. can't say yeah. about why. But uh I, I don't expect things to 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 loosen up anytime soon. But uh wow. it's it's uh yeah. It's wild, guys. Yeah, I hope <laughs> things do. And we're gonna discuss today, of course, with you why they are so important, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls and how they really impact our study. I mean, I've been interviewing Jonathan Adler recently, and I just interviewed John J. Collins the other day and his work and how he sees yeah. the rise of what we call Judaism actually happening pretty much Maccabean onward, like pretty much. Yep. Um, are there some forms of something prior? Maybe. I mean, like he points out archaeologically, though, there's no evidence they're actually keeping the laws that we're seeing written in the Torah, the, t- the Pentateuch, if you will. Um, but after that, you start seeing all sorts of archaeological evidence to suggest that common people, like the everyday people, are starting to practice this religion. And this is where we get these fragments that play a role in the origin of this thing we call Judaism. So we're going to discuss this and you know whether before, or not you're a bible before we scholar. move on can you move this this question here from from man bear pig or this this statement wasn't, wasn't the, israeli the israeli general in charge uh during the six-day war called moshe, uh, called moshe. 
I'm not sure about that, but I will tell you that um, the uh, the deputy prime minister at the time of the Six Day War was Yigal Yadin, who was also a, a tremendously gifted archaeologist and uh, biblical scholar. And um, this is this is a, a an amazing story that I will I will get into into some greater depth in, in your series in my series. So they need but, to uh, subscribe. You guys need to subscribe. One of the one of the most uh, famous, one of the most recognizable, one of the most impressive of the Dead Sea Scrolls is called the Temple Scroll. It's the largest of all the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's it's gigantic and it's not even it's not complete. Like we don't have the beginning of right. it. Um, it's badly damaged. And one of the reasons it's badly damaged is because uh, when the, at first the, the, the Bedouin uh, were, were found all these, these fragments, these loose fragments, and they were bringing them into the uh, Palestine Archaeological Museum to sell them uh, to scholars. Uh, but they would, they would bring them through a, uh, an antiquities dealer in Bethlehem. His name was... Uh, 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 his nickname was Kando. Again, lack of sleep. I'm I'm blanking on a lot of this stuff. I'm sorry, but uh, okay. so he 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 would broker all these sales basically between the Bedouin and and the um, uh, the scholars at the uh, Palestine Archaeological Museum, and um, it's said that over ninety percent, ninety maybe even over ninety five percent of everything that was discovered actually passed through his hands. He was he was holding he was pulling some things back and mm. holding on to them, you know, as as later discoveries started coming in. There's so much material um, with an eye to, you know, the future. He was he was he was planning on um, on setting something aside that he could make some real money on. Yeah. So and one of these items was the Temple Scroll, which was this incredibly impressive, large manuscript. Um he word is the rumor is that uh, that he hid it under the floorboards in his bedroom, and as it sat there for years, it actually the the whole bottom rotted. of the of the manuscript rotted away. Um, and scholars, people kind of knew about the existence of the temple scroll, um, and he had it there for I think it was I think it was nineteen. I'm I'm probably going to get this wrong, but I believe it was either it was either 19 somewhere between 1959 and 1961 that the cave 11 was discovered. So that's when he had it, and he had it all the way up until the uh, the Six Day of War, and um, he was you know in some soft negotiations with some anonymous um, uh, representatives. Uh, to to try and sell the temple school originally he wanted to sell it for a million dollars and um the uh the offers weren't that high uh or at least not all of them um it's stuff i'll get into in my series but uh to shorten the story up uh um yagel yadin who was the deputy prime minister at this time knew about the temple scroll and as soon as the war ended what happened was uh kando's home was part of the annexed area as well. Mm. So like I've heard I've heard various versions of the story. And one version of the story I've heard that they literally rolled the tanks, the Israeli tanks up to his house and like, walked like, inside made, made and him. basically, you know, grabbed the scroll and huh. walked out with it. Um, I've heard other, I've heard other versions of the story that no, there weren't any tanks and it was just some, <laughs> some representatives from like the, the state police force. And so, but, but, you know, they ended up basically, you know, grabbing this thing. I, I must point out that, um, um, Kendall was eventually paid by the Israeli government for the scroll, but this, I mean, this happened quite a bit later. Wow. Initially they just came in and grabbed it. So geez. Anyways, there's yeah, lots no. to talk about. Yeah. So we've got all right. So we already have some people who are throwing money at us. <laughs> and of course, <laughs> I, you know me, man, my ears perk up. Hey, support the channel uh by super chat. So we'll get into that here in just a second. Don't I need the money. Exactly. I do want to let everybody know once again, Dr. Kill, as he goes by, 
is trying to grow his YouTube channel. So let's grow it. And I'll be checking the subscriber count when we get done here at the end. We're at 7.01K, which means he just broke 7,000. Yeah. So and the, gonna... there's less than 10. So 7,000 what? Less than 10? No? Yeah, I think you want me to do a live check. Get an exact amount. You. Well, now the it's going to... Some people have subscribed probably oh. since we started. Wow. wow. I'd imagine. Well, this says 7,012. So where were you at before we started? The, I think I I don't know. I think it was probably I didn't check it yet. So we will come so. back to it. Okay. So we're hoping people will Which, subscribe. You and think I think we'll get up to what like a hundred thousand by the time we're finished <laughs> the stream the stream here. I wish. Um, okay. we'll we'll hopefully get you like twenty or thirty maybe. I don't know if there's <laughs> new people to tuning in. <laughs> I hope we can grow it there. Um, also keep in mind, you know, I mentioned the Patreon a lot, right? So. He's here in person. We're doing a series of lectures, pretty much. We're going to be documenting a like the real ancient Israelite religion, and we're going to have that documented, but based on the actual evidence. And he's going to be going through an extensive, call it a course, yeah. if you will, um, showing and, and teaching that. And you'll be able to get the course once that edits and stuff. I will actually be put... here for a full week. Full week. Living in, in Derek's basement, like in... Like, like a Hebrew debt slave, yes. not a chattel slave. Not a chattel. Um, debt slave. Debt slave. So that means it's good, right? It, I'm just kidding. It's better. It's better, right? It's not it's better it's not, than chattel. Not so bad, right? I don't think. Yeah, like here we are, apologist for a form of slavery. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, um, seriously though, he's here. It's all here bad already. people. We're gonna be recording the course, but I also want to emphasize about being a Patreon member. We're gonna take one question per Patreon member. And I'll be recording that again in 4K, like I've done with Dennis McDonald, and I'm still editing those. I'm going to be pumping those out like I did with Richard Carrier, like I'm doing with other academics that I've done. You get your question in by supporting the channel and becoming a Patreon member. And by the way, you could join as little as three, um, and the tiers go up from there. We also have the course on Mark that we have launched out with Dr. James D. Tabor. You do not want to miss this course. Link is in the description. This is what it looks like. For anybody who's like, well, what, what's in it? Lots of content pertaining to this mystery gospel that was forgotten by Christians. Yes, it's in the canon. But and every time they're reading Mark, they want to jump to Matthew and they want to go to yep. Luke and they want to emphasize John and they want to. But Mark needs to be read as Mark. And he is a scholar who ex, he has an expertise not only on Paul, but recognizing Mark. And here, reading recommendations, bibliography, lectures are all in 4K. So you're going to see him actually teaching and taking you through it. Sign up for the course. There are seven lectures in that course. I think we're going to have and quite I mean, a bit. Look mm -hmm. at that handsome man. It, look at that guy. It's, I mean, you can't. You just, it makes you want to take the course from him. Of course. Look at his face. It's like, it's shining. I'm almost terrified yeah, right now. I kind of feel like. He's seen someone's body parts, back parts on a high mountain. It's just <laughs> glowing. Dr. James D. Tabor is a fantastic friend. I love him to death. And he really like puts his heart into the Mark course. And all of his students at all of the universities, every time he lectures on Mark, are like, that's our favorite one. Because he is telling you like, listen, no, no, no. Did you hear that? I don't think you caught that. Look at what Mark said. And he's just... What a wonderful teacher. So here's my shameless plug for helping the academics, such as Dr. Kip, once we do his course, you'll be able to sign up for his course. And it does help him. So it's it's a win, 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 win for everybody to be educated as if you were in a university. And it's 4K. I mean, if, you're, if your vision's bad, right, go get a pair of glasses and then actually watch it in 4K. The quality oh, yeah. is just phenomenal. So... Please consider signing up. There's my absolute somebody, shameless plug. Yeah, that was right a there. shameless plug. Somebody, I noticed somebody in the chat asked Derek if there's any nudity in the course. That's on OnlyFans. Oh, okay. You know, All and right. we'll set that up this week. Okay. You know, that's so I can I can confirm for my course <laughs> there is no nudity, but there is guaranteed profanity. Yeah. yeah. So. So you're, and that's something that we talked about when you early on. I asked Doctor Kill. I'm going to refer to you by your AKA. I asked him about 
did they do human sacrifices, which Francesca Stavrakopoulou actually wrote her dissertation on this very thing in her first publication was like, yes, there was ancient human sacrifice. And it seems that the Bible, the text we have has a fossil in it of this idea. And you said, yeah. And then you played a clip that I never was able to show because you took it from game of Thrones, that moment where the witch is like telling the guy to sacrifice his daughter to the gods in order. I can't even remember what the goal was. Maybe you have. Oh yeah. So Stannis Baratheon is trying to defeat um, the army in uh, i believe it's in westeros to take to take control Mm. of the uh city because he needs it for his uh campaign to become the ruler of the seven kingdoms and there's this there's this harrowing episode all about the sacrifice of his of his only that was like skin crawling it is but there's another important part and i don't think you've seen this um in my lecture and this is so this is i i this is part of uh part of the course you'll get to you'll get to see all of this um it's uh lecture 7.2 sacrifice and appeasement and um the the second scene that i feature from uh game of thrones in that um uh in the course in that lecture also shows because i think people human sacrifice is, is one of the most awful things ever I mean, let's get, let's be clear here. This is, this is the truth. Yeah. But I think we, we have a tendency to, to step straight from that to whoever made this decision or whoever um, was involved in something like this must have been just an absolute monster. Right. But they weren't. And I think this is, if, if anything, I think, Something like human sacrifice is is a dire um, warning, even to uh, to all of us, uh, just how capable we all are as human beings who think we're doing the right thing and who oftentimes will will make um, terrible decisions. This out of is, sheer desperation. I, I want to add that earlier when you came here. I said that's why I, I like I'm scientific in my thinking because we connected dots in the ancient world that we now know they're yeah, not right. genetically connected. Oh, why is there green? Why is life coming? Oh, well, Venus. Well, every time yeah. there's spring, you see a certain star in the sky. It's the star that has the power of life. Now we have, no, there's cycles in which we measure time, but Venus isn't bringing life to Earth, right? Whereas the ancients might have attributed to this god in the sky, uh, this planet, a uh, planetary body. To, you know, they thought, well, if I sacrifice this it's magic, number one, that they believed actually caused some type of change uh, and, and may help bring crops or help the nation to get whatever it might be. We now know better yeah. than that. And I think that's your point. If yes, I'm not mistaken. exactly. We now know better. And I, that's why I think we shouldn't judge them as they weren't doing this to be cruel and bad. And that scene even shows it in the game of Thrones, which made my skin crawl. Yeah, yeah. The guy didn't want to do that yeah. to his daughter, but the witch insisted that he did it. And the screams. And he sort of like he, and, and in the other scene, you see where they play this, this, this whole, this whole interaction between him and his, and his little girl out. Like mm-hmm. it is, he he's in a position where he feels like he has no choice. Yeah. Like he has to do this. Yeah. He hates the option, but, also recognizes that that it's his only one and i one of the things that i i i like to do and what i hope to do through the course there's several things that i hope to do through the course um but one of those things is to to really try and humanize yeah to the people who who lived at that time who 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 practiced weird shit I, I'm sorry, I'm, you're I have to me. add while you're saying that, I hope that our descendants do the same to us. Yeah, I hope that they're critical right. of what we're believing and doing today. But, but at the same time, recognize that we're people just right. like, just like everybody else. And we're going to, we're, we're going to mess up and we're going to do weird things because we think it's the best thing to do. Like, why would you so, grow your goatee out like I that? Just, I mean, come on, you know, it just <laughs> encourages people to grab it and to drag me around on the floor and to, <laughs> and to, to punch all my teeth out. Exactly. So. Sorry, that was... I'm throwing it out there just being <laughs> yeah. stupid. Your yeah. point, though, 
So is, don't judge the the ancients in that moral sense. Learn from their mistakes. Understand I, why. I think it's okay to judge, but I also think we have to first understand, and we also have to first put ourselves in a position to to recognize um, all the factors mm -hmm. that were at play. So awesome. Okay, and everybody, thank you for. We literally hit the 30 minute mark right wow. now. So that's perfect timing. Let's do it. Constellation Pegasus. What's going on with Rashi commentary in Isaiah 45, one through seven. It says the temple was destroyed and Israel sent into exile because Cyrus didn't build the temple and let others do it. Hmm. So Cyrus doomed the nation. Confusing. I thought Cyrus was the one saying, go back and build it. He's so, the hero. Yeah. So, um, I, so, and I'm, I am very sorry constellation pegasus that uh i i don't know rashi uh very well it would take me some time to 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 look this up and 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 see what's happening um you know i i i maybe i hope this this uh this will serve as a as as a soft consolation for me failing to answer your question um i was actually reading an article uh, a couple days ago um about um about second isaiah in particular and how much the cyrus propaganda that's in there is uh is is close to and and uh uh follows uh much of the other cyrus propaganda that was written by the uh the babylonian priests um who if you don't if you don't know the story um cyrus the 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 great uh internationalist the great accommodator um maybe the first globalist uh recognized uh brilliantly that uh how important um religion i guess for lack of a better term was so one of the things that he made an effort to do uh when he uh conquered babylon was to restore all the uh all the temples to marduk and and got right in with the uh with the um the priests of marduk who still mm -hmm. exercise lots of power in the city now marduk is not is not um cyrus's god uh and then one of the reasons this this made such an impact is because he was uh ousting uh nabonidus who had uh who, who were told had uh you know neglected the uh the marduk cult and he went off out into the into the uh the the wilderness there and started worshiping and started set you know he set up a a, a cultic center to the god sin and you know of course in the minds of the uh the marduk priests this this incurred the wrath of marduk uh, which is why the 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 nation fell apart Persia. under Nabonidus, and yeah. that's why Persia had to come in. In fact, there's one of one of the texts. Um, uh, I'm I don't remember offhand which one, but one of the texts actually has has Marduk in in uh, first person calling to Cyrus and inviting him to come in and and uh, and restore the city and to uh, to make it great again. It's make Babylon great again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. So what's Maba? Is that what you're trying to say? Um, Maba. <laughs> so um, what I do think is, is interesting about what you said there. <clears throat> if we took serious that literature, the way a Bible believing Christian or, or Jew might read it. Yeah. Um, if I read it using the same kind of approach they do, I might walk away thinking this God really actually said these things and that they actually, you know what I mean? Like, It'd all like, be Mardukians. Yeah, all Mardukians and uh, Dookie. That sounds kind of funny. Um, but yeah, like that's why aren't we granting the same credibility to that as we're over here doing to the Bible yeah. and special pleading? So thank you so much, Constellation Pegasus. For real, really appreciate the support. Always seeing you in the chat. It means a lot. Nidimus dishing out death blows to the apologists who rely on dead sea scrolls oh it's coming <laughs> the whole series we've done it we've done a little bit already but it's it's coming and and uh um i hope everybody's seen the uh the introduction 
uh, videos so far, the, the first one in the series. Um, the second one is, uh, is available to watch on my, uh, on my Patreon where I, the, uh, the, uh, the Isaiah scrolls, not just the great Isaiah scroll, but the, there were actually two Isaiah scrolls discovered in the first cave. Um, and in that one, I much more directly tackle, uh, the apologists themselves and some of the apologist, uh, apologetic rhetoric that has surrounded uh the scrolls falsely or at least um in half truths and uh one of one of my goals is is to to try and and set the record straight and to level the uh level the field a little bit in terms of uh in terms of who is is telling the stories about these uh, about these manuscripts and about this literature. So the Isaiah uh, video is um, that the second one? That's the second one. So it's on Patreon. It's on Patreon. Okay. I'm gonna look I'm, it up. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna sell the farm right now. Okay. Um, it's it's actually going to be published on uh, on YouTube for for everyone uh, this week. Okay, but you so. are going to be looking for. I mean, you are going to. Um, make more of course i'm making more and uh i expect uh part three to be loaded up to my patreon sometime in mid-february okay i think this is you that's yeah. me this is you so now just to let everybody know how they can come and support and what you're doing you have a patreon and this I is do. this is uh 1.2 so get ready for a series go become part of kip's family and do you answer questions? I mean, whether you do or don't, it's your choice. Do you answer like when people message you on here? Can they directly message you as Patreon yeah, most supporters? Yeah, most of the time. I I, I think I'm I've done okay with uh, with answering questions. My uh, my higher tier uh, patrons, I have promised. Um, I think I promised it once a month. I hope I can live this up one? to that. Yeah. It, do you only have two tiers? I have two tiers. Okay. So, but my uh, my higher my higher tier patrons, I actually promised uh, a private uh like like a private session. group session once once a month uh, it may not be quite that often and and something that i have suggested too and i'm kind of keen on doing and and maybe you want to want to be part of this i'm i'm going to start uh, exploring this in earnest but uh, those documentary hypothesis videos that michael jones uh put out i thought maybe it would be fun to sit down with my patrons and just watch through them carefully mm -hmm. and uh and, and to and to talk about them and 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 to um yeah to uh to to see what comes out of that maybe we'll uh maybe i'll i'll manage to make a video i had a scholar come too. on who like his two phds wrote a book called why abraham murdered isaac mm -hmm. and he's a supplementary hypothesis guy mm -hmm. and he came in and he knew right away when i sent him the videos and said hey let's do a discussion he was like i can tell already just by the videos that i saw well well uh edited very good production he, he had positive things Michael's to say sharp. he is very sharp he said but i'm gonna tell you right now like no serious scholars in the field anywhere in legit like academic circles that are talking textual criticism that are dealing with biblical studies like this are trying to harmonize homogenize the authorship of this literature so you know we can disagree over is that p is that d is that e is this this that is it supplementary is it documentary is it this and that but at the end of the day he's like nobody's trying to do an apologetic to make Genesis one and Genesis two, the same author. Um, nobody's trying to take Genesis six with a flood and make it a single author that is writing two different accounts into one thing. Like nobody's doing what he's trying to suggest in this video. And it's almost unanimous that while we don't agree over the minutia of things, we all agree multiple authorship with multiple different, uh, voices yeah i'll say it that way yes. voices so anyway yeah. i think that it's not only going to dish out death blows minimus to the apologetics out there i think it's going to bring death blows to serious scholarship as well in the way that they are approaching dead sea scroll material i'm not going to say it's actually going to make an impact to them because they live in ivory towers mm -hmm. but i i think for anyone who reads them and they'll hear your angle and take that there's a lot as we talked about upstairs and i'm sure we'll cover over this week yep. that is being ignored or yeah. isn't perceived yeah. even by scholarship.
Yeah, maybe we should talk about that a little bit before we get to the next super chat. Okay. No, I, sure. I, I was going to say my my sights might be set a little bit high, but but I mean one of my goals is is um, uh, peace in the Middle East, uh, maybe to to come out from my uh, I'd my love Dead Sea that. Scrolls series. That that would be great. So <laughs> that's a little high, but you know it's only I, you know, yeah, the I, entire region going so and having peace. You know one of. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and while we're waiting for peace in the Middle East, um, one of the things that uh, that I also want to bring out uh, with regards to the Dead Sea Scrolls and why they're so important is um, so within within biblical scholarship, and one of the reasons one of the reasons that I went into uh, studying the scrolls early on, I'll I'll confess at the outset. When I uh, when I had decided to go to grad school and when I I decided to pursue an academic career, um, it, it wasn't my first choice was not uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. In fact, there was there was a time I seriously considered uh, pursuing uh, Syriac texts, um, which would have been fun too. But um, one of the reasons why I uh, I I started working on the Dead Sea Scrolls in grad school was because it's you're dealing with a period of time between 250 BCE roughly to about 100 CE this 350 year window um and it's and it's right in the middle if you're a biblical scholar working on the scrolls you're working on old you know, you're probably working on old testament texts and you're working on on uh, uh, interpretive biblical interpretive methods and and traditions dealing with Old Testament texts, but then you're also dealing with this whole cultural world and uh, and and you know what's what's going on in the New Testament and this this you know what what we at, at a time talked about this this parting of the ways between Judaism and, and and Christianity so there's there's right away when I I kind of got in there you could see and and for lots of of people who entered the field like I did I heard much the same things like you're you are dealing with um, a, an enormous collection of literature that that rather you know stretches, uh nicely into both camps because for most biblical scholars they either distinguish themselves as an old testament scholar or a new testament scholar there's there's very few if any real true um both yeah uh who who can do it do do it well enough i don't know if there's any left anymore and part of the reason for that is just because everything's gotten so specialized but then what i have discovered um, I mean, it's a nice idea, but what I have discovered is that it's not just that, um, I mean, the, the, the public has, and there's, there's a public perception about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yes, we've got all these manuscripts and there's a whole bunch of Bible in there and they were collected by this weird sect of Jews who, you know, uh, would, would, uh, ritually bathe and, and, uh, had these, these strange ideas about the end of the world and, and, and about the, uh, the people who are controlling the Jerusalem temple. People know a lot of this stuff, but even among scholars, um, I think we fail to grasp really the grand significance of this. When we're talking, like we're talking about the earliest mm. copies of any Hebrew Bible text and, you know, multiple copies of most of the Hebrew Bible texts. In terms of actual hard data, that's the best you can. That's get. it. There's yeah. really nothing else earlier than this, and this is all from, like I said, as early as 250 BCE. So all of this, all of it, post dates, um, you know, Alexander's conquests mm -hmm. and the the um, onset of Hellenization throughout the region, which deeply deeply affected Judaism. What we're dealing with when it comes to the Dead Sea Scrolls is really like the kernel. It's the origin story mm. of Jewish religion, of Christianity, 
Um, but more importantly, and I think this is where, where, where people tend to miss the point, um, you know, it tells us a great deal about even what preceded it because we just don't have any, we just don't have the textual data to support, to support the ideas that scholars have, have put together with regards to what we call Israelite religion. I mean, we, you know, scholars are looking at, uh, at the archeology, span they're, they're digging in the dirt, they're, they're, they're cataloging and they're examining artifacts and material culture. Um, but there's not much in terms of, of there's no literature there, um, no Hebrew literature, or um, I, I let's call it. I, I don't even like Hebrew when we're talking about that period. Let's talk about uh, um, um, Aramaic. Like no uh, Canaanite. It's okay. like a it's like a sorrow. It's like a sorrow Canaanite uh, group of people, right? There's there's nothing but but not literature. And when I'm talking about literature is is these are these are you know fine works this isn't documentary texts like letters back and forth between generals or or um 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 markers of uh victory markers set up by by generals and kings no i'm talking about literature which is predominantly what we have in the hebrew bible so right. my doctor fodder was george j brooke and he used to say to me he said that when I, this is him speaking. Keeping it, yeah, do it, do it. I when love I, this. <laughs> when I teach the Old Testament, he said, I do it differently than everybody else. He said, and everybody does it wrong. He says, I do it right. This is, this is Professor <laughs> Brooke it. telling me. And he says, the way I teach the Old Testament, he says, I don't start with like Genesis or I don't even start with methodology and with like the documentary hypothesis and 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 uh with with uh, uh the 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 typical things that that most teachers tend to start with when it comes to, to to teaching a class like the introduction to the hebrew bible he says i start with the scrolls he says and the reason i start with the scrolls is because this is ground zero this is the starting point like this is what we have mm. and he says we have to work backwards and we have to work forwards from this point but this is the point. I this mean, is where it all is. This is so powerful what you're saying because like for those who've watched Russell Gaberkin come on and he thinks there's more Hellenistic uh, position to the Bible. Yeah. I don't know. I'm no expert, right? But I like I listen to this and I really enjoy his perspectives. And he goes and he makes his first book, Genesis. And um, he so it's, it's Genesis, Barosis and Genesis, Manitho and Exodus. And of course, he goes in to be critical of the Pentateuch. He's doing it from the literary yeah, yeah. standpoint. And he he does ground zero. Like he's like, all right, we have Dead Sea Scrolls. And the best we have is that there's supposed to have been a translation of a Hebrew version of the Bible that we have traditionally into Greek. I mean, like this this is like the Septuagint. Right, the Septuagint. Yeah. And this is like the best we have in terms of knowing that maybe something's going on. Other than that, he's like, everyone else who's arguing, if you go to any of the go to you name it, especially 19th century scholars. They use historiography. Well, they accept what the text says as if it's telling you history. And you kind of just take it. Well, Josiah discovered a scroll. Well, well, you know what? This is where they actually wrote Deuteronomy. So it's not that he actually discovered a scroll. It's when they actually wrote Deuteronomy. And that's been the, the model everyone's yeah. worked with. And, and he will, wants to challenge so, that. Yeah, but, you know. I will say, sorry to, to no, feel free. on that point, I just want to tell everybody that if you haven't watched it yet, you all need to go and watch uh, Dan McClellan's brand new short uh, about the uh, about Josiah and about the Deuteronomistic history. And it's on YouTube? Yeah, it's on YouTube. So it's uh, it's his, his most recent video on his channel, but it's very, very good. Like Dan does like these nice short little little uh videos and this one is just he's so oh, slick he's excellent uh, we should so. like do shorts about his shorts and put yeah. like the little like two the... oh, look see he's got a new one already today so it was uh why was asher vilified okay. and he, he had uploaded that just uh yesterday but we should probably okay continue we should probably continue yeah i mean we have so much we're going to cover this week and i hope to record it with a high quality camera yeah. so there's yeah. just so much to discuss about this Stupid whore energy, thank you for the super chat. What is mm. the value of DNA research, if any, question. in evaluating the Dead Sea Scrolls? Yeah, yeah. 
So if you if you didn't know, um, there have been uh, a DNA uh, tests conducted. I I don't know how many. I'd have to go back and look. I have the I have the numbers somewhere. But a number of the manuscripts uh, in the Dead Sea Scroll. So and and just to give everybody an idea of what we're talking about here, we're talking about roughly nine hundred manuscripts, um, probably tens of thousands of small fragments that have been. Uh, basically pieced together um, <laughs> on the basis of a variety of methods, um, which constitute over 900 or around 900 individual manuscripts, all dating between about 250 BCE to about 100 CE, roughly 20, 25%, maybe 30% of them are what we would call biblical scrolls or copies of biblical books. I hate that term and I get into why <laughs> in my, um, in my, uh, 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 like in my, uh, series, my YouTube series. Um, most of the other literature is stuff that we've never seen before. Uh, they're, they're different, uh, different types of, of works about, um, you know, the prophets or, you know, there's, there's text in there about angels or about Enoch. And then there's a whole collection of, of rule texts for governing, you know, for, for life in the community. There's, there's piles and piles of liturgical looking stuff similar to the Psalms. It's just this massive collection of, of all sorts of different types of literature. So several of these manuscripts i'm and again i don't know the numbers offhand have been uh the, they they've been dna tested and I, I i'm i'm not i'm not really clear on on all of it i haven't done a ton of reading about this particularly but i do know it, it might have something to do with dating but one of the very valuable things of uh dna testing is that this is one of the methods by which they've managed to match uh, your amongst this, you know, jigsaw puzzle, this ten thousand piece jigsaw puzzle, but it's 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 worse than you think because we don't have you know a picture on the box of what it's supposed to look like in the end, <laughs> and it's even worse than that because uh, you know most of the pieces are missing, so you know it's an incomplete jigsaw puzzle so oh, there's wow. all sorts of things that that scholars have had to do matching handwriting matching damage patterns on mat on men on oh uh, individual gosh. fragments the most of the most of the the fragments are parchment so um one of the things that that has been done has been uh, counting the hair follicles on the on the uh, on the hair side which is usually the recto side of yes the recto side of the manuscript um, and and looking for for hair follicle patterns and DNA has been quite helpful in showing oh this fragment actually came from the same animal oh as wow this fragment. that's awesome so you know yeah. more than likely they were part of the same sheet at one period of time so but I you know that's something that uh, it's uh, lots of the the science uh involved in the study of the dead sea scrolls is is pretty wild and, and interesting and uh i i wish i knew more about it i hope that uh i hope that that helps to answer your question at least that's awesome thank you so much for that super chat being fairy with psalms twenty two sixteen, is the christian bible wrong in its translation is does the text actually say like a lion and not pierced if so why is christianity being dishonest uh I wonder if you're the if you're the person who asked this question on uh, on one of my videos just the, in the last couple of days. I remember seeing this question on uh, on one of my videos. So I'm going to try and do this quickly, um, and I'm going to recommend you can find things like there's actually a good 20 25 minute summary on Gnostic Informants channel. I I, I talk through uh, in considerable detail uh, the the fragment that contains Psalm 22, 16 from the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it's actually from uh, a, a scroll that was discovered at a place called Nachal Hever, which is in the Judean desert region, but not actually part of what most people consider the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are those that were found in the 11 caves of Qumran. It's further, it's further south. Um, so uh, there is one fragment from a, a, a Psalms manuscript that, that contains uh, this text. And um, 
uh, how to how I'll I'll try to answer this this quickly and and reasonably concisely. So um, was Psalm twenty two sixteen in the Christian Bible wrong in its translation? Uh, yes. So, but it's it's much more complicated than that. Does the text actually say like a lion and not pierced? Yes, it says like a lion and not pierced. If so, why is Christianity being dishonest? Well, I don't think they necessarily are. And what's happening here is the way I've explained it, I think the way I explain it on uh, that Gnostic informant video is that what's taking place is a scribal error in the in the manuscript itself the the person who has copied this text from another manuscript has made an error he's made a copying error and this copying error has caused confusion for the translator of the septuagint and so the translator of the septuagint translates the word uh ka'ari which means like a lion as uh, uh um, I, I don't remember the Greek word offhand, um, but the, the Greek word means to dig. Um, and it's he, he translates it that way because he thinks it's the, the Hebrew verb keru, um, but a weirdly spelled uh, form of keru that exists virtually nowhere else in any Hebrew manuscript in the world. So this is what the Septuagint translator has done. So he is looking at a manuscript that already has a mistake in it, and he's trying to figure out, what do I do with this? I think it might be this word. So what it ends up saying is, uh, dogs surround me. Um, I, I, I Offhand, I'm sorry, my brain is... is and, and just is so you know, I corrected the link fog. in the description for his YouTube. For okay. some reason, it wasn't filling out the whole thing. Oh, So subscribe okay. to Kip's YouTube channel, but I did have it pinned in the comments. Dogs surround me. A pack of evil ones uh, closes in on me uh, like a lion, um, my hands and my feet. It probably means something like, like a lion, they have mauled my hands and my feet, or like a lion, they've eaten my hands and, and my feet. My, my hands and my feet are gone. Um, so the way this reads, though, in the Septuagint is um, dogs surround me, a pack of evil ones closes in on me. Literally, they dug my hands and my feet. And the Hebrew word there is most commonly used for like digging a pit or digging a grave. Um, overzealous uh, Christian apologists for um, un, you know hundreds of years now have looked at this and assumed that what this means is they pierced as in dug holes in my hands and my feet. So ergo, this must be uh, a prophecy of the crucifixion. It really isn't. If it is, I mean, it, it's it's the sorts. It's the product of the sorts of accidents that occur all the time within within manuscript production in antiquity. And I mean, this is how this is this is how lots is this of, a Jewish idiom? Like kind of like no, born it, of a woman. And I've heard mythicists will say like, hold on, <clears throat> born of a woman is. Who would say someone was born of a woman? Of course, everyone's born of a woman. You're not going to be born if you weren't born of a woman. But it's not. It's like saying no, he's a man. I, I, no, if if it's it, it's not a Jewish idiom. It's not an expression we know from from anywhere. Okay. Um. So, like I said, the word in I, I think I did the numbers once. I think it occurs nine times in the in the Hebrew Bible. In eight of those times, it talks about just you know digging a hole, basically. Right. right. The one time there's one time where it appears. Um, metaphorically in a psalm about uh, about basically boring boring a hole in your ear so you can hear kind of thing right and I think that's the closest analogy you can get to um, the the reading in the Septuagint but I think I need to be abundantly clear here it's not just the the, the translation that's a problem the word itself if it is, you know, keru, this verb, it's not spelled correctly. And it's spelled so awkwardly that it's extremely difficult to, to forward this idea that this is, and one of the re this, that, that this should be the reason. And, and I'll finish with this. One of the reasons 
why we should be confident that it's not it's not just a just a novel spelling of the word is because when scholars analyze uh, early Jewish manuscripts, uh, you notice all sorts of different types of spelling conventions at work. Mm -hmm. uh, to put to put it simply, you know, you've got manuscripts that have what we call short spelling and manuscripts that we have what we call long spelling and everything in between. And uh, the the reading in uh, in the manuscript from Nachal Hever is long. The problem with it is that the scribe for this whole manuscript, because we have multiple fragments from this manuscript, the scribe consistently spells very short. So mm -hmm. it just, it doesn't fit the profile on any level. Thank you so much, Bean Fairy. Really, really appreciate that. Um, I noticed I have a huge fan in the chat. Where are they at? Oh, here they are. Um, thank you, Aaron Flower, for the wonderful compliment and the amazing support that you have for me and what I do. It's just wonderful. I never challenge Tovia Singer over the Torah or Jewish faith. Appreciate the compliment, man. Really appreciate that. Um, <laughs> I just saw it in passing. I was like, I'm going to pop this up. Like, it's funny how I, I have to make a comment about this. That's just, just for audience okay. to understand. Yeah. Like, um, and you and me talked about this actually on the phone multiple times, like about about this, Toya. Well, about this whole ordeal and yeah. criticizing. And oh, stuff. yeah, it's tough. Well, yeah, it, it is tough because at the end of the day, like Tovia knows I don't believe, and you know he doesn't challenge me trying to shove Judaism at me or down my throat or anything like that. Um, and I have no goals in sitting here trying to like, I'm not that kind of guy where it's like, all right, now you're wrong. And you know, like, that's not the kind of atheist. I you're am. probably not the right guy to do that. That's not right? my interest. That's yeah. Not, yeah. In fact, there's a reason he won't show up. I suspect on the typical atheist channels out there, you know, he knows that I'm more interested in information and the yeah. ideas and discussing these things. Yeah. Um, but I think if your agenda is that you want a, atheist experience call-in show where it's challenge everyone who's a theist everyone who has a claim that may not be grounded with any evidence you know when i'm doing these episodes that's not what you're getting so and if you there's think a, there's a place for that it's yeah but not, the, the hypocritical here, part right? is they're like well yeah but they're like it's hypocritical because you're not challenging him but you do it you with christian others, apologists you challenge christian apologists right yeah. and i guess to give myself some credit on this is i was a christian and I was in the Christian apologetic arena. I went to college in the vein of Norman Geisler. Like I was yeah, legit yeah. going down yeah. that apologetic route. And at the end of the day also it was like, I've enjoyed some of the discussions I've heard from Rabbi Toby Singer. And I'm like, okay, but he's, he's just a delight to listen to whether yeah. you agree with him or not. I just, I, yeah, I'm yeah. Listening he's, to him. <laughs> he is fun to listen to and you can learn some stuff and you can disagree at the end yeah, of the day. Totally. But I think that, there's like this, you know, you shouldn't be buddy buddy with a guy if you're going to be critical of Christianity and Christian apologists. But here's the deal. I'm friends with Christian apologists. Yeah. I've even invited Christian apologists on the show yeah. and I challenge them on these things. But they're like, you double standard. You don't do it to Rabbi Tevi Singer. I don't know. Name any Jewish rabbis who'd be happy to just come on to discuss our differences and stuff. Maybe I'll make that happen at some point. But I just, it's never been a goal like, hey, I'm yeah. ready to challenge you, dude. And yeah. trying to pick, never, I met the guy in, in over there in the Holy Land. We were in Jerusalem hanging out. It was nothing like that. So I don't know. Yeah. I felt like making the comment. All right. In passing. Contextual religion in the house. Thank you for the super chat. Do the books in the Dead Sea Scrolls, such as Enoch, Book of the Giants, mm -hmm. Genesis Apocryphon, and so on, look like they're new to the culture? Or do you think... There's as old as the Abrahamic Moses-like Moses story, stories yeah. we know, and we're done away with. Yeah, you know, there's 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 a couple different schools of thought on this, and um, uh, I and uh, so these are uh, what, one of the interesting things. <clears throat> excuse me. One of the interesting things about the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, is that um, it's not just Hebrew literature. There's lots of Aramaic texts in there, and there's a handful of Greek ones. And I honestly, I I, I don't know what to do with those. Um, but there's lots of Aramaic texts. Um, 
And uh, oh, another one of the interesting things is that um, there seems to be a pattern within the Aramaic literature. Um, all the Enoch texts at Qumran are Aramaic. All the so-called, what, what we call, uh, the, there, there's a, a handful of manuscripts identified as pseudo-Daniel. Um, but there's a whole bunch, there, there's a bunch of other scraps of uh, fragments that, that I would classify as Danielic, as in, you know, related to him in one way or another. These are Aramaic. Um, there's, there's, uh, texts like the, the Testament of the, the 12 patriarchs. There's, there's an additional testaments of additional patriarchs. These are all in Aramaic. Um, the Aramaic Levi document, uh, there is a pattern, uh, within all this, this literature, um, whereby it looks like there's, there's a relationship there. And, um, I'll, I'll mention the name of one scholar, uh, Gabriele Boccaccini, uh, out of Italy, uh, wrote a book once. Um, I believe it's called, um, oh, I'm going to get this wrong. He wrote a book basically about, uh, Enoch traditions at Qumran and forwarded a really novel argument whereby he suggested that there was an Enochic Torah that was in competition with the Mosaic Torah. Isn't there like five sections I heard to in the Enoch? Enoch? Yeah. So it's almost yeah. its own Pentateuch in yeah. a way. That's I, That always caught my attention too because I haven't read that word. And it's Aramaic. It, it really makes me wonder, especially when I read Enoch, the Enoch is the Moses of their tradition. Yes. And they're competitive between... You have Enoch, which precedes. It's almost like they're also jabbing because they're saying, yeah, you might have Moses, you might have Moses but our but guy got goes Enoch. way back. And he was even he taken got visions, by God. He was in heaven. You know, he he got all this cool shit. So, <laughs> um, it, so it's, but this is, uh, and uh, Gabriel Boccaccini has, has uh, structured this argument historically too, to, to, to try and link, uh, this idea of these these factions, these wow. priestly factions, which collected these these two separate Torahs, um, and he's attempted to link this historically to to uh, some of the the goings on uh, during the uh, uh, the Seleucid and the Ptolemaic uh, periods, right. just prior to the uh, the Hasmonean uh, revolt. There, it's all. It's all really, really fascinating. Um, now, I think I think one of the things that, um, that I should point out here too, uh, when you're adopting a view like this, or when you're exploring a view like this, uh, it also really raises the question again about like how how antique is some of this stuff, anyways? Like, certainly nobody believes that uh that the books of Enoch go back to Enoch anymore, that anyone believes that the books of Moses go back to Moses. Or that Daniel I, goes, or back that Daniel goes back to Daniel. But um so but but what what this does suggest if the if Boccaccini's right and if there really were these factions that that controlled these streams of literature then then we would imagine that they're roughly contemporary with each other and maybe all of this hmm. really uh we can only really trace it as far back as as Persia and that's like and we don't even have that's the thing about what Jonathan Adler's saying like we don't really have don't. anything that actually there, there seems like early parts of Daniel is in Aramaic and it may go back to, like you're saying, this Persia. Um, but no definitive, it's all linguistic historiography and like they're trying to like, yeah. they're trying. Um, well, I if like, you're a maverick like David A. Falk, oh, you'll just yeah. throw Daniel right there in the 5th century BCE. Still trying to wrap my head around that one, but anyways, that's that's. Besides I can't the wait to see you cover more on that. Someone was saying, "Hey, I noticed you responded to him." Yeah, go check him yeah, out. Yeah, there's and a there's, new one coming. There's a lot, I'm sure. And uh, uh, Doctor Doctor Dan McClellan, Doctor Joshua Bowen, my good friend Doctor Matthew Monger, the famous Doctor Moat, we're all getting together. 
uh, to to watch us some uh, some David A. Falk, ancient Egypt. Tall ancient Egypt in the Bible or something, I think is is the yeah, name of his channel. Like and and I have a special guest coming too. It's a surprise. Not not telling. Oh snap. I can't wait. And no. Derek Bennett's gonna be doing a response to That's that true. stuff coming up because he did a jab. Uh he did his popcorn review. Yeah. And so maybe was, I'll was, hand Derek some popcorn and he really can fun. Oh, respond. Yeah. Perfect. Know? Popcorn for popcorn, right? Oh. Eye for an eye. Great question, though. I love that question. That really is. I'm glad you went down that rabbit trail because I forgot about that with Enoch. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, no. What's going on in Jordan? What's going on in Jordan? I missed it. <laughs> Scrolls there hidden from the public? <sighs> Thank so you So this that. is – I got – I'm sorry. This is – like, it's contentious. Um, and there's so much more going on that I just I, – I can't, I can't talk about publicly – um, all I can say is that, uh, and I, and I honestly can, all I can say is, is Jordan is not as politely declined, is continuing to politely decline, um, scholar, you know, academic requests, requests from Western scholars, uh, to come in and examine their, their Dead Sea Scrolls and hearing it from their side. I've seen, I've seen emails, email exchanges between, uh, the director of the uh, of the Department of Antiquities in in Jordan and some of the scholars, uh, some some of the scholars he's he's um, talking to, and I gotta say, I mean, if I was in his position, knowing if, if some of the things he says is true, then then I also would be reluctant to uh, to open things up. But I honestly, I'm sorry, I can't I can't say much of anything about this because it's it's really really sensitive okay thank you james thank you for that super chat yeah! was there a sect oh, of israelites nice. who sacrificed children are they talked about in the hebrew bible or is there some other source for this so i i wouldn't say it was a sect i would say that israel um the parlance the archaeological parlance of um what we identify as ancient Israel is not much different at all from uh, uh, their Canaanite neighbors in terms of uh, how they lived and uh, how they practiced religion. And one of the things that scholars are, are quite confident of is that uh, uh, child sacrifice was a uh, part of religious practices in the region and that would include uh, that would include Israel, and we see we see fragments, we see echoes of this throughout um, the Hebrew Bible. Uh, in the Book of Exodus, there is a there is an instruction in one point to uh, to offer your to firstborn. offer your your firstborn son, basically, along with the firstborn of your your Cows. flock and 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 your your the first fruits of your crop, of course. This is then repealed in Leviticus and in Deuteronomy. Um, Ezekiel reflects back on this and, and says that, uh, that, that Yahweh uh, gave commands to the early Israelites and they sacrificed children. And, you know, he did so as a means to uh, incur their guilt. So there's, he's, he's <laughs> taking like maybe not direct responsibility, but he's certainly implicating him. Not Yahweh is implicating himself in this practice. You have, uh, examples of child sacrifice in the Hebrew Bible. The offering of Isaac is a child sacrifice. And there is a, there is a, a, a Midrashic tradition from the medieval period, uh, in which Isaac, uh, is actually killed. By he dies. Father. And he is resurrected. Um, there's the offering of Jephthah. Jephthah's daughter yep. is a uh, is a child sacrifice. There is uh, there's there's evidence that suggests that that uh, the writers of the Hebrew Bible viewed child sacrifice as efficacious, meaning that it worked. Um, Not that a, they thought it was good nece these, necessarily. These writers, yeah, right, right. but at least that it worked. There's um, there's which, which would would explain why they would offer, they would sacrifice children to Yahweh. Right. Um, there's uh, a story of King Misha who offers his, his firstborn son as a sacrifice. And the text, the natural reading of the text, despite what, what Michael Jones wants to tell you, 
the natural reading of the text and this is this is largely the this is this is the majority opinion among scholars the the natural reading of the text suggests that the sacrifice worked and that the sacrifice turned uh the battle enough that uh that Israel ended up going uh retreating and uh Misha got away and I'll uh I'll just mention I mean there's there's uh uh kings um uh um Manasseh and I believe his father um I, I'm going to get the name wrong offhand but but there are there are there are kings uh Judean kings who who offered uh human sacrifices uh Josiah this mm-hmm. isn't a child sacrifice but when Josiah goes on his campaign of um of cultic reform uh, one of the things that he does after cleaning out the temple and then and then destroying all the high places, one of the things is he that he does is he goes to the shrine at Bethel, and uh, it says there that uh, that he broke down the altar, and then it literally says within the text that he sacrificed all the priests on the altar. Mm in uh in bethel and this is a sacrifice to yahweh most of your bibles will read that he slaughtered uh the priests but that's not the word the hebrew word is he sacrificed them i do think it's ironic too like for those who try to argue against this their entire christology is built off of the notion that god needs a human a human sacrifice sacrifice. yes he needs it yes this so is, this is what this is. And when I was interviewing Francesca after reading her book, um, I've got it somewhere up here. You know, I love the brag showing that beauty sex, sexy book. Um, is that the uh, God the, and the anatomy? Book. Oh yeah. Okay. And I wanted to like, yeah. I really wanted to like press in on this idea that, you know, the way that Yahweh loved the burnt offerings and sacrifices and stuff like their it's food. It's the, the language there, okay? The uh, it's it's very interesting. It literally says throughout the throughout the text that when sacrifices are offered up, um, they they go up as a pleasing aroma. You know, yeah. he's taking it in, right? Um, and uh, one of the things that I I, I like to point out um, is that um, the the word the Hebrew word for nose is off and it's also one of the words there's several words used for wrath wrath or anger but this is this is one of the more common ones it's it's synonymous Mm. uh there's a relationship here between and and the relationship is uh embedded in this idea that you uh you offer sacrifices up the the uh the god um intakes the pleasing aroma and it soothes his wrath Hmm. This is the this is the location of the wrath. This is what you need to fix. It's kind of interesting. I, I wanted to ask, like, up. what about the human so. sacrifices? You know, like, does that barbecue smell good to him? And, and apparently, it smells better. Now, I mean, and this is one of the things. I, and I get into this a little bit in in one of the lectures in my course. One of one of the things that that we do see is that there is there's there's a passage in the bible which which suggests that there's like there's an incremental um there's an economy here uh when it comes to sacrifice and um uh it's in terms of in terms of what's most what's most valuable uh to to the god and child sacrifice is right at the top of that it's interesting that Cain and Abel's story, you have multiple threads. Like you have some that say oh, yeah. God did not want to sacrifice. He wanted, you know, your good behavior. Yep. And some people will capitalize on that and say, well, God never wanted a sacrifice to begin with. But then you have those who go, well, I, maybe there's multiple traditions and different people have different voices. But when you read the Cain and Abel story, yeah. he's not happy with Abel or with Cain's, you know, veg, isn't it? His vegetables. vegetables. Yeah. God's like, give me that blood. Give me, the give blood. me that, give you me know. The blood. So, so. Yeah, and, and part of the problem here too is that you're dealing with uh, the Hebrew Bible as it's constructed is 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 layers and layers and layers of uh, of tradition, you know, just stacked on top of each other. Mm. So where you see places where there's you, you know God wants sacrifice and then He doesn't want sacrifice, or God God wants the blood of your firstborn son, but no, really He doesn't. What you're what you're actually seeing 
is 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 the uh, the the history of tradition right there within the text. So the the, the scribes and the and and the priests who are who are reading this stuff and rewriting it uh, and fixing it, fixing it, correcting it, correcting it. I love making that, it though. making it uh, uh, useful because really that's what this is all about is making it contemporary, making it useful. And this is, I mean, despite what any uh, a Christian church wants to tell you this is this is precisely what what everyone is doing today with their Bibles. Right, they're making it as palatable as they possibly can so that it can still be useful. Mm -hmm. uh, and not, nothing's changed. I we we go about it a little bit differently, but this is the way they did it back then. The, you know, you wrote, uh, you know, there's all sorts of problems with Exodus, so you have to write Deuteronomy, or or Leviticus, or Ezekiel. Right, like it's or it's, prophets to adjust these exact things. Exactly. Well, you know, God actually what He said and what He meant and what, and that's what we see with the philosophers in the Greek mythologies yeah. and how they saw Zeus. It's really fun to see this. It's almost like we're doing archaeology through a totally yes. different lens. Archaeology of the text. Yep, it totally is. I yeah. love that expression. I love that too. Thank you so much. I'm sorry. I detoured us into it so we'll try to blast through these so we can go okay. eat lunch and all right and you know sounds good constellation pegasus any conspiracy theories about israel possibly hiding some text because they contain some bad stuff to support uh to support their religion i no, i, w I would say not um and i actually think i mean i mean truth be told i'm i mean there's plenty to be critical of the israel antiquities authority about um but truth be told uh the people that they have uh working there and in my experience i've 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 met a good number of these people i've worked with them in 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 the labs at the uh at the israel museum these are the best of the best and you know i the the israel antiquities authority for all its faults and all its flaws has managed in my opinion uh to maintain a a pretty impressive commitment to science in uh in they 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 may not get it right all the time and it may take them a little bit of time because because of political pressure and believe me the political pressure in in Israel when oh. it comes to the material culture is fierce yeah even just period the, the tensions in the yeah. air in yes. Jerusalem for sure. Yes. So yeah, I I I'm so I'm I'm sorry I'm I'm not I I'm highly skeptical that that they've got stuff that they're they're hiding from the public. Thank you, Constellation, Doctor Aaron Adair in the house. Yeah. What can you say about the Copper Scroll? Is there any consensus on its origins oh. and interpretation? The Copper Scroll is. Sorry, I can't swear. <laughs> it makes me want to <laughs> it's swear. Mother, it's ah! amazing. It is one of the most amazing artifacts to survive from an antiquity. And if you don't know, what we're talking about is a sheet of beaten copper measuring three meters and engraved with text mm. how cool is that how cool is that so um the copper scroll in simplest terms is quite literally an inventory of temple treasures and their their locations after having been absconded from the temple right and uh i'm I'm not I'm not uh, up to date on uh, on where the discussion is now with regards to the temple scroll, but I believe that most scholars would tell you that this is legitimate, that uh, this is an actual I inventory of temple treasures that was um, commissioned and then. I mean, what do you even say? Written? No. Engraved? I don't know. Um, it, it, it built <laughs> by by somebody connected to um, the temple, 
and it was uh, it, it was done in anticipation of the uh, the Roman invasion of Jerusalem. Somebody saw the writing on the wall in advance, uh, and you know worked like a mother to to get the loot out so that the Romans wouldn't get their hands on it. And in order to to make sure that they didn't forget where they hit it all. Now, how early would we say, like sixty five ish to in between yeah, that area? Yeah, thereabouts. And I, I have to go back and look uh, and look and see how they dated the Temple Scroll. And I, the 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 script is is uh, is pretty late. Is is what I would call it, like a late Herodian or a post Herodian script. So it's right in the right in the ballpark there. Probably, yeah, it's before the war started. Okay, um, but I think it's it's one of those things where where I mean, you know. It, 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 the war was a long time coming. <laughs> um, so now, oh, wow. now, um, this raises a very interesting question that nobody has satisfactorily answered yet. And that is this. What's it doing in Cave 3? Yeah, like if this is a temple, this is a serious... And, and I'm thinking copper. It's not a scroll. It's a copper scroll. So... so Let's, I mean, to give people an idea, most of the scrolls were made of, of, of vellum, um, like animal skin, uh, sheepskin, cow skin, most predominantly, but there was some, some sheep and ram as well. Um, there were, there were a number of scrolls also made, uh, with papyrus, which was, a, which was cheaper. Uh, papyrus was quite a bit cheaper. And, uh, and we actually know now too, that this was, uh, they didn't have to import it from Egypt. There was, uh, there's actually places uh, close to the area there in the south, uh, in the Negev, where uh, where papyri, uh, papyrus reed grows. So um, they were sourcing like like papyrus relatively locally uh, to make these things. These were this was your always your cheapest option for writing um, like a like a, a a manuscript or a scroll. I'll, I'll say a scroll. Um, animal skins were more expensive, but they were much more durable. Um, and they're much easier to read. Uh, but these cost a small fortune. Now, considering the, the economics of what it takes to, to write, to commission and, and, and write a scroll, just the materials and, and you've got to hire, you've got to hire the scribe to do it because this is not, this is, this is not something that just anybody can do. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lengthy process. It's it's uh, it, it, it's a labor intensive process. It requires a great deal of skill. It's expensive. Now, you're doing it with copper, beaten copper. This is a treasure. The scroll is a treasure. And I'll just say one more thing about it, which is super cool. The copper scroll, uh, when it was discovered, um, it was still it was rolled up, right? And uh, it was it was extremely brittle, um, fragile as hell. And uh, uh, John Marco Allegro um, worked with the uh, Institute of Technology at the University of Manchester my alma mater, uh, to develop um, a method for opening uh, the copper scroll. They basically uh, built a special saw to cut carefully every, uh, cut it into sections. And now it survives in sections. Um, wow. But at the University of Manchester, where, uh, where, where I, I studied for a time, um, there is uh, in in my Dr. Fodder, uh, Professor George Brooks office, while he still had an office at, at Manchester, he had a, the one and only, as far as I know, it is the one and only uh, replica of the rolled temple copper. scroll yeah. made, of, made of copper. It was super cool. Dude, that's wild. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you so much for that question. I will absolutely be talking about the Copper Scroll in my Dead Sea Scroll series. I can't wait. What? Dr. <laughs> Mott. Matthew Monger here in the chat. Oh. It's not too late for Syria. Matthew's just being kind. It's because <laughs> he's he's much younger than me. He's got time. Uh, maybe you have time, Matt. 
Matt, look, I can't wait to do more with him. I always enjoy recording oh, yeah. with Matt. I can't wait to do more. I'm, you know, I, I, I am hoping Matt and I are actually hoping to 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 do to do some serious, serious uh, actual uh, scholarly work together. I can't wait. Future. Matt, love you, man. Thank you for coming in and dropping that. Dr. Aaron Adair, love you too. I uh, I hope we get some work done in the future. Continue doing what we're doing. Pam Palmer, thank you for the super chat. Love Myth Vision Channel. Love the Myth Vision Channel. Thank you. Appreciate that. Always makes me feel good to know that what we're doing is helping people. I get I got an email, by the way, yesterday that I was tagged into that was sent not only to me, but also to Francesca Stavrakopoulou. And this person wrote, they literally, I mean, like it is emotional. And it was like, you have no clue how much your channel has changed my life for the better. Oh, like wow. it's great know, to it, hear stuff like that. Yeah, like, yeah. I mean, it was the most inspirational thing. And I was like, wow, it's good. First of all, that Francesca seen it. Cause it's hard to even get her to email back. She's so busy, but I, I know that she sees that and sees the kind of what it's doing, freeing people from ideas that really kind of trap people in this bubble. Yeah ethically um world, world view right so you you think your yeah. ontology whatever it might be it's a it's a freedom that you just you realize like whoa we are what are we doing you know yeah right thank you so much for that stupid horror energy's back again you know i got used to saying the name after a while it's just like you know well what? If, I, I if, if james from modern day debate can say it 10 times a night Right? Oh, I, I mean, you didn't even know that he says. I mean, then again, I haven't watched him that <laughs> He's gotten much. very good at saying it. Ah, okay. Well, thank you for the super chat. According to the Dead Sea Scrolls, Isaiah 53, 11 says, mm -hmm. after the suffering, mm -hmm. he will see the light of life, makes it compelling as a Christian prophecy. Were the scrolls at all influenced by Christians? I'm, maybe I will disagree with you as to how compelling that, uh, that change makes uh, makes it as a, as a, as a Christian prophecy. Um, I certainly know, uh, one of my mentors, uh, professor Peter Flint is the one who, who, uh, did the work on this particular manuscript. And this was a very, very, as a, as a deeply committed evangelical Christian, this was a very, very meaningful discovery for him. Um, from my perspective, this is, this is something that still fits quite quite uh, seamlessly within uh, within the type of uh, Jewish expectation that was taking place, you know, in and around the uh, the period in which this, these particular texts in second Isaiah uh, were written, uh, which is which is right right around the Babylonian exile. Um, this reading comes from 1Q Isaiah A. Uh, the great Isaiah scroll, which is dated to um, it's most commonly dated to about 125 BCE. I think that's too old. I would prefer to set it closer to, I, I would prefer to set it uh, closer to early first century BCE, but certainly first half of the first century BCE. Um, and that's just too early. Um for any kind of Christian influence. Now, with regards to Christian influence on any of the rest of the texts, uh, that is, that is a, it's, that, that would be, I would say more difficult to demonstrate. What we certainly see within the Dead Sea Scrolls is that um, the people who were writing and collecting the Dead Sea Scrolls and Paul and the early Christians were part of this same cultural milieu and shared many of the same ideas and they and they they read texts very similarly to one another. Um, there was a there, there was a thought um, I don't know uh, where the scholarship is on this now, but for a time there's a there's a, a set of um, manuscripts that preserve a text called uh um it's called it's abbreviated mmt and 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 the english translation of of that is is some of the works of the law um it's thought that this is this is sort of a this is another one of these constitutional documents almost a a, a declaration uh by the members of this particular community to 
um, their opponents that, um, you know, this is what makes us uh, distinct from you and this is what makes us right. Um, there was there was a suggestion for a time that um, much of what appears in uh, this 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 document MMT actually uh, corresponds, um, but like reciprocally, uh, you could actually see a conversation taking place between MMT and something like uh, the Book of Galatians. Hmm. Um, in terms of of the 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 the, the question response with regards to what is the law and how do we keep it and what what right. are we so I know it's been it's it's been suggested that that there's 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 some connection there's it's also been suggested that John the Baptist uh, wasn't a scene and connected to the Qumran community or even Jesus himself. Um, and these are these are difficult and they're challenging questions. I personally don't don't have a, a strong opinion on it, but I would, uh, in terms of uh, influence, Christian influence working the other direction on the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, I, I I don't I yeah it's would it be safe to say you think that the Dead Sea Scroll community had more influence on early Christians? I would say that they didn't. I, I would say that I don't even know if I'd go that far because I don't really think they cared that much about each other. Um, I would say that they're they're in the same world. So like today, Small world. if we imagine today, there's yeah. so many different pockets of groups and stuff and we brush shoulders, but we identify in different camps. Yeah. And, and so you wouldn't necessarily say there's a genetic, like I've had a no. Dr. James Tabor came on yeah. and he pointed out parallels, right? To show yeah. how Jesus does things that look as seen. Yes. Then he does things right. where he's like, no as seen would ever do or say these things. Yeah. If you were to try and take the picture painted about him. Yeah, exactly. So he's like, if we were to try and identify Jesus, he isn't in a scene, but he does things like a scene. But then he also does things like a Pharisee, like he did. Yeah. So his point is, is so, like maybe he's not, you know, maybe they've talked and communicated yeah. in some way, but and not. I'll, so I'll say, I'll say one more thing about this. And one of the things that makes this this a difficult question to answer is 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 because of the mess that the New Testament is. The New Testament is is a is a, a document that that was written in the Greco-Roman world. This is not a Palestinian text. Um, it's, it's, uh, and, and for that matter, um, you know, my, my very simplistic understanding of, of, of early Christianity sort of follows this, this model where there was a church in Jerusalem, uh, in the beginning, this is where, where it started, but we really know almost nothing about about that it church. and i mean there's nothing no no literature has survived all we have is this later stuff from from like paul and from you know the the gospel writers and then the 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 second century uh pseudepigraphers um and they're you know they're reflecting back on not just a a, a period of time but also like a like a whole like a like a re there, there's a there's a regional issue there's a language issue there's mm -hmm. a there's a time issue and and it's hard to it's hard to do this kind of archaeology in the new testament to get back to see clearly um you know what was what was the early jewish expression of christianity we were we're at a loss yeah you know and some have suggested oh well dead sea scrolls it was it was the essenes and I, i'm just like you know what i just i don't you it that's too far like it's not it's closer to that but it's not that hmm. thank you so much for that constellation pegasus why are two here making a video and not at a kingdom hall supporting jehovah's one and only organization armageddon is right around the corner i saw on my drive in here that there's a church of scientology there is yeah. there's there, well we got it's pretty big too we've got mormonism yeah. around in like they come around the elders come around and if they come knocking on my doors i'm like hey guys That's come on chat. in <laughs> come on in and talk with me and um we have good discussions that was I, I haven't had them do it here yet but back when i lived here two years ago i used to have like two young guys that were on a mission and it, we had good conversations if i were ever to to reconvert 
I think maybe I would be Mormon. <laughs> it's a fun, it's a fun thing to journey into. Um, <laughs> maybe Tovia Singer is just watching all your episodes. Aaron, thank you for the super chat. Maybe. I love Toby. I mean, I think he's yeah. a wonderful guy. I mean, you might have disagreements with him, but he's, I met him in person and he, he's, he's pretty cool. Actually he took us around Jerusalem and everything. So nice. yeah. Anyway. Um, Is that it? Yeah. I think that's, hold on. Let me make sure. A little... Scrolling down, scrolling down. Wow. There's a lot of chat. We, we... I am. Oh, oh. Marg's in the house. Good to see Marg Develin. Thank you for the support. Was there a period when they were forbidden to sacrifice humans? I oh, think there's a point yeah. where that. Oh, certainly ends. Um, yeah, like I mean the the um, the inheritors of what we call Israelite religion, the what what became Judaism, were absolutely fundamentally opposed to uh to any kind of human sacrifice so but we just yeah how far back that goes yeah we just don't know thank you marg thank you and by the way um make sure you ask a question we're going to record these in four tang <laughs> tang uh, but you know, i'm gonna create the post on uh on the patreon is dr kip the little spoon <laughs> What a dick. This is this is an inside joke. Oh, I thought he's talking about you and me or something. Okay. But actually, it, it I'm like, what is it just dawned on me? So uh, I'll 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 clue you in. Um yesterday, <laughs> um our Oz's Oz's good friend um Braxy. Okay. And uh Mr. Pritchett. Got it. Uh they do, I mean they do a live stream together every uh every week. And they're usually sitting at their own desks, you know, talking to each other. But they had a they had a special guest on, so they had to they had to cuddle up and <laughs> and share share a microphone. So just squeezed up. But, uh, but we haven't we haven't established that yet. Yeah, we haven't. Ozzy, Oz. um, we'll let you know tomorrow. Yeah, we'll let you know. It's going to be probably a rock paper scissors situation. We might incorporate the pistol into the, you know, we we'll figure out, we'll let you know how that one works out. <laughs> Thank you for showing you know, up. They didn't like it when he asked them that question. Oh, really? <laughs> oh gosh. Thank you so much for that. And looks like this is our last one. Would you say there was intersection of Palestinian Judaisms of the day? And this element was in the new Testament with Greco Roman bias built on it with Jesus. That's a little bit. Uh, Would you say there was intersection of Palestinian Judaisms of the day, and this element was in the New Testament with? Yeah, like I, yeah, definitely. Like I think where where scholars are now, and again, I'm I am not a New Testament scholar. I'm I spend all my time in in the scrolls and and in the early Jewish literature. I know a little bit um, about the new Testament, but I believe where most scholars land is that there is, I mean, there is clearly a Jewish, there is clearly a Judaism, uh, behind, uh, the, 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 the emergence of the church mm -hmm. and, and oh, of, yeah. of, of Christianity. Right. And yes, well, you're absolutely. Paul right. has some form. Oh, absolutely. Of, you know, yeah. Even if it's so, Christy, it's still. Yeah. So, and, and that's really def, that, that is really one of the, one of the, the, the very strong uh, elements that, that comes out in the, certainly the, the, the gospel presentation of yeah. Jesus. He's, yeah. you know, it's, it's very much a, you know, a, a, a Romanized, grayicized but yeah and, and yet you still see you still see snippets and in, in pockets of again this 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 uh this earlier layer right right of um of judaism in the new testament so and honestly um you know prior to the discovery of the scrolls uh in terms of jewish literature uh, the you know all you had um was uh, so you have uh, well, yeah. I was were, were was Elephantine discovered before the forties? I thought it was. Maybe I thought they knew about. Let me look that up. Okay. Actually, that's worth so. While you and and maybe you know, 
uh, forgetting about Alafontine for a minute, but but it was certainly within, um, yeah, cer certainly relative to the to the area too. That's another important aspect of this. Is this is stuff that was actually discovered? Yep. You know, just outside of Jerusalem, right, and not in Egypt or not in uh, Europe or or um, um, around the Mediterranean or, or or something, right? So. Um, so it says oh, 1898 yeah. Yeah, to 99, early. Richard so, August, yeah. Yeah, but uh, so like prior to that, you yeah, you have the Elephantine uh, stuff and some of the, lots of that's really, really interesting and, and odd. Um, so much so that I think the first discoverers, the the, the first the first readers of, of the Elephantine uh, uh, papyri uh, probably um, uh, dismissed a lot of it as Jewish, right? Because it's you know, it's it's odd. It's, yeah. it's strange, based on our expectations. Um, so we had that, but most 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 scholars just looked at that and said, yeah, that's just a mongrel. Um, you had Josephus, you had uh, Ben Sira, you had uh, you know the 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 early or, or the late the late uh, stuff from the Bible. So you have like Ezra, Nehemiah, Daniel um you you've got philo and then you've got the rabbinic literature and problematically the rabbinic literature which on the surface of it looks like it's it's the 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 purest representation of uh judaism from the time of jesus because at the mishnah level you're it, it's all you know it's uh, the 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 mishnah the Amarim are all like as early, they're all, they all start in the second century uh, AD, like CE. And I think, I think they're second, second, third century. Um, so they're, they're close, right? They're close to uh, the time of Jesus. Um, so beyond all this stuff, for a long time, one of the best sources, ironically, that we had for Judaism was the New Testament. Um, and you know, I mean, that was troubling to a lot of people, um, for a long time. And it, and it, and it caused all sorts of problems too, because for, a, for many, many decades, you know, there, by just reading the new Testament and attempting to, to, to gauge a picture of Judaism at the time of Jesus, it ended up being kind of a caricature, um, because it's like I said, because it's 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 not even though there's 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 clearly Jewish roots here. It's not it's not a Jewish text. It's this is the difficult part that I've been trying to flesh out is how how Hellenized can Judaism or even Jews be to the point that is it even recognizable in our by our standards? Yeah, right. Could the Jew could the New Testament actually be Jewish literature? Um, at least some of it. I'm not going to say all of it, but it's not what you would expect. Um, so it's 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 in the vein of something that is so radically Hellenized that you're like, whoa. Um, on the other hand, I I tend to think there's this the parting of the ways that is taking place, yeah. and something becomes so Hellenized, you almost wonder, is this really not Judaism anymore? Is this something else? And th there's it's not either or, right? We deal yeah, with the same right. thing today, politically speaking, with sex and gender and all this stuff. It's like totally. there's spectrum here on yes. the literature. And, yes. and it's so difficult to pin down because it's not like, hi, O Theophilus, we're writing to the Christians now without Jews in mind. Are you ready? Like <laughs> yeah, It's right. like here's yeah. this god fear transitional Gentile strange thing where they enter the synagogues and then now they have a whole new thing. So much stuff, so much stuff, so so much stuff. <sighs> I love it. Is that love it? it. Uh, we oh, got this one, one here: tunnels, oh, yeah. AVA sirens. Why was the church threatened by the scrolls? Do you think they hold the truth about Jesus? I think there's a there is a um um a misunderstanding here. Um, the church wasn't threatened. Uh, I would I would say the church wasn't wasn't threatened by the scrolls, and I think what the what the um the questioner is getting at here is that uh so in terms of a timeline uh the first scrolls were discovered in 47 1947 
And then there were discoveries for the next six years up to 1953, at which point they discovered K4, which was like the mother load. So there's over 550, I think, manuscripts just from K4. And the really cool thing about K4 is it's right there at the the archaeological yeah, side the of the famous Pimon. picture yeah yeah and and the thought is because this was uh this was an artificial cave that was actually you know dug into the rock by people and then there's you know there's there's indications that there might have been like shelves for for storing you know uh manuscripts the the thought is that this well maybe this was like a library even right. right so like not all the caves that's another important thing too not all the caves are the same like there's and i think one of the really interesting questions with regards to the scrolls is with the variety uh just between the 11 caves in terms of the the dating and in terms of what we think they were used for like what, how, how does this affect the way that we, we read and understand the scrolls? So, but that's, you know, again, that's something I'm going to get into in my, um, in my big series. So, um, discovered between 1947 and 53 and then cave 11 was discovered, I think in 59 or 61. Um, and it was the last, uh, the last cave to be discovered. And then, um, volume one which was all the cave one materials. This is the, the publication, the, the, the official publication of the Dead Sea Scrolls was, was uh, handled by Oxford Press. Uh, and volume one, it's called The Discoveries of the Judean Desert series, uh, appeared in 1953 as well, 1952. And then um, volume two, which was uh, uh, archaeology and... Um, scrolls from the caves at Murabat, which is another one of these groups of caves that are farther down south, closer to Angedi. Um, that was volume two, and I, I'm pretty sure that appeared in 1953 or 54. I'm probably going to get the date wrong. And then very few volumes after that. Uh, volumes three, four, five, six, and seven. Um all came out between like 1954 and 1980. Oh wow! Yeah. So they were just discovering over the and decades. yeah, and and like like the uh, cave three is is the small caves. So that's like all the all the stuff from the little caves. And then um, uh, I I don't remember offhand. I, I one of those is um, is the. The, the great psalm scroll from cave 11 and then cave five is is the volume that um uh was deemed this is the volume that mark uh john marco allegro uh edited and was deemed so awful that <laughs> that uh, they almost um the, the plans were in place pretty shortly after he published it basically to revise the whole thing um, and it is now coming out in uh, in Dead Sea Scrolls editions. Um, and then, uh, so, but the there was very little material from Cave 4, the mother load, that was being published for a long period of time. And the way the uh, the way it worked was this was a, a a hand. It was a team of scholars that was handpicked by. Um, uh, first, uh, Father Roland DeVoe, who was the head of the Ecole Biblique, which is the Dominican school, French school of, of, of archaeology in Jerusalem. Um, and then after he passed away, it was John Strugnell, um, who was a, a converted Catholic. So this, there's this this idea from outside that they were they were holding stuff back or that they were right. or that they were afraid for religious reasons that's just not the case um it was it was it had a lot to do with funding um it, it had a lot to do with um um just weird editorial squabbles that were going on just within the team itself like like it was a small group um i think at the the largest the team got was was maybe 11 people hmm. um handling 
all these fragments from all these um all, all these manuscripts and then they started to endure a ton of criticism from the outside when they would have like Strugnell and um uh Frank Moore Cross who's who's an American would have doctoral students you know come and you know work on fragments of the Dead Sea Scrolls that were not published uh, you know for their dissertation work and and you have like like uh scholars who've been in the who've been begging for access for decades going what the fuck right like what is going on why are like these 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 wet behind the ear you know, doctoral students getting <laughs> access to stuff that I, you know, I have to beg and plead and get turned down like on a daily basis. Right. So, um, and, and, you know, eventually, um, there was, uh, Emmanuel Tove, um, was installed in 1991. He was the, 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 the last editor of the series. He was, he was the first Jewish editor of the series. And, uh, with his, installation replacing strugnell then then it really broke things open and things mm. things came out but it was I, i'm going to repeat there were there were many extenuating mitigating factors which contributed to the slow publication and and the 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 uh the group the the group of editors who were all catholics predominantly there was one or two you know uh protestants in that group and virtually no you know, non-confessional people in that group, uh, they became really defensive, but they also became uh, kind of entitled. Um, but uh, again, not for religious reasons. They said, they said, this is all politics and nonsense. Thank you so much for I'm that. I'm not calling your question nonsense. I'm saying what was happening with them was nonsense. Got it. And and you can blame yourself, by the way, for the continuous super chats that keep coming in. <laughs> Sorry, hey, I, I'm I am a long-winded No, no, I'm glad I love these answers. I'm just, you know, making sure that you know that you can blame yourself, not yeah. me, <laughs> for the show keep going. Uh thank you for becoming a member of Myth Vision. I really appreciate that. Joining the membership gives you absolute true. Dead Sea Scroll Salvation. Absolute okay. true. Without a doubt. So Guaranteed thank you. Guaranteed by the Copper Scroll. That's 100%. Critical faculty, thank you so yeah. much, Hanny in the house. Cheers, Derek and Kip. Keep up the great work. And Hanny actually has a video coming up with Guts at Gibbon, if he hasn't already done it. Yes. Guts at Gibbon, uh, Aaron Ra, and Professor Dave Wicked. on Evolution together. Wow. So be on the lookout. I will be making an appearance on Critical Faculty in February. Ooh, you're going to want to go subscribe. Go subscribe to his YouTube channel. Lady Wasser, forgive me if I butcher your name. This is one of my my uh, loyal right? Patreons. Is it Wasser? I think so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let's put you on the spot. Why don't we, right? Yahweh be blessed. <laughs> Finally, we get to see Dr. Kill and not the Minecraft avatar. Great work, guys. Oh, Thank gosh. you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Canadian internet. What can I say? <laughs> Inquisitive mind. What do you think about 4Q MMT is the author James? Oh. So I talked a little bit about 4Q MMT. Um, and I'm getting tired. So I'm just going to say, no, it's not James. Okay. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll just, uh, you should go back and, and watch if you didn't catch it. I talked a little bit about it uh, maybe 20 minutes ago. Um with in in response to a question about uh, whether or not uh, Christianity influenced the Dead Sea Scrolls, got it. So the ghost of Myth Vision, good to see you here. Thank you for tuning in and dropping a super chat. And then one more question here: and what do the scrolls show about Second Temple exegesis? Oh, yeah, so oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. that's going to be well. I mean, one of the things one of the things that that the scrolls show us about Second Temple exegesis is that the New Testament authors, and in particular Paul, were just doing the same thing. So the second, second Temple Jewish uh, scripture reading and interpretation uh, is dynamic, and it's varied, and it's creative, and uh, it's not... It, 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 uh, it, it's very interactive with the text and we have, I, I mean, it's so complex and, and there's so much 
variety that one of the things scholars are still scrambling to do is to sort through and figure out how to how even to talk about all this stuff mm -hmm. you know various various terms have been have been uh uh coined and i think in many respects unfortunately applied to the text you've got some texts that are designated as reworked versus rewritten versus paraphrase versus pesher um versus you, you know you've got um for you've you've got some text and i i'm still not even entirely sure the rationale behind this but there is a, a group of manuscripts that's been designated pseudo ezekiel and another set of manuscripts has been designated pseudo daniel and you know that's reflective of another idea about the exegetical activity taking place there so it is broad and it's varied and it, and it's very interesting um but one thing that we know for sure is that the interpretive process was a scribal process and what i mean by that is that the way jews uh were reading and interpreting what they believed to be quote unquote scripture you know whatever that meant uh it was part of it was part and parcel of the transmission of the text so it it was part of copying a manuscript copying a biblical manuscript was also meant you know interpreting that biblical manuscript thank you apollos appreciate the support i really appreciate everybody in here so yeah, before you go we're gonna check and see how many subscribers subscribe oh. to dr kip davis and before i refresh which you're gonna refresh now refresh. but don't tell him yet don't no, tell him yet. we want to keep it a secret okay just like the copper scroll okay we don't want them to know where the treasures are yet we're gonna refresh this and check it um i really do appreciate you all go support dr kip davis over here on his um uh, his patreon you can join there's two tiers he is dropping early access in a series of dead sea scroll videos He's not just sitting in front of a webcam. He actually is editing it. That would be enough even for me, but it's like it's a lot of work. It is. And I got to join your Patreon, by the way, so that I can actually see this How stuff before nice everybody else. You. Yeah, actually, yeah. we should do that. Well, I'm going to do that so that nobody sees my billing information. But I'm going to join <laughs> uh, as soon as we get off of here. Out. Do that after. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I help. Look, I Gnostic Informant, Derek Bennett, you know, I support them. So I got to come support you. So I hope we can get some, some Patreon supporters to help Dr. Kip Davis and what he's doing. Um, to motivate you also to, to notice that this is an area of your life that putting time and energy in is worth. Yeah. Also, we have the Patreon and I have so much content. I re early release. And this week over the week, we're recording the next course. I'm going to be taking one question per Patreon member. And someone actually said to me, because I was like, you know, join the Patreon, get one question recorded in 4k. Yeah. And like, what a ripoff. Why would I do that for one question? <laughs> But here's the thing they don't even – these people who are criticizing don't even yeah. realize. Like I'll like I'll be sitting – I'm going to give people a tease here. I'll be sitting over here, right, in these chairs. By the way, it's blurry because I have it not on automatic here. Um, I'm sitting over here, and I'll say let's just use the Apollos Christian Apologetics. Thank you for your question, right? I'm, yeah, center, brother. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your question. So he wants to know, what do the scrolls show about Second Temple exegesis and the New Testament? Wonderful question, Dr. Kip Davis starts to respond. We have a 10-minute dialogue. Now i got to do this because I'm such a ridiculous – I like to show by actual action rather than just words, right? I'm whipping out my 4K Canon R R5C here. I'm filming multiple angles. 4K, got to edit this stuff later. And you have a video where you are featured asking a question to a Dead Sea Scroll Bible scholar. And it's 10 minutes by joining the Myth Visions Patreon for $3 a month to help support us and grow what we're doing. Nobody month. is doing this. No. Nobody. Who the hell wants to for $3 a month? I believe in people. I believe in our audience. I know yeah, they man. want to help. That's why I'm like, okay. Help us out. Consider joining. And I hope that we don't get overwhelmed with too many questions because I know you only have one week. But we're going to do what we can. Oh, yes. Yes. We only have one week. So that's so, my... And it, and it almost didn't happen. <laughs> it almost didn't happen. I've got like... I, by the way... I so have, I, have to, I, have to, I have to tell the story. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, you do. Let me I see. left yesterday afternoon to uh, to make the to make the the six hour drive down from uh, Chilliwack, Canada to uh, to southeastern Washington. Oh, gosh. and uh, I got as far as Seattle, and I was reaching for my backpack with my my computer bag um, because I I needed some Tylenol. <laughs> Seattle wild. and it wasn't there. So I called my wife and she confirmed for me that yes, like an idiot, I had in fact left my computer. I ought to show home. like just just to tease them with the name of the email. <laughs> oh my god, that's I almost want to do it, but then again, there might be private emails I don't want people seeing. It's it's Kip Davis's email, right? And then the so, the title of the email is "My husband is stupid." LOL. <laughs> and then <laughs> it sends me this email: "My husband is stupid." LOL. And I'm like talking to him on the phone. He goes, "Did you see the name of the email?" Like, and I'm like, "Yes." So he had to turn around yesterday. He I been turned here. around and drove all the way back. And then I left very, very, very early this morning. And Got stuck police. in customs for almost an hour to be here yeah and so i like even before this live you had to take a quick nap and yeah so but yeah i'm here he's here get him while you can uh join our patreon help support us also we have the mark course that we just launched which is the latest of courses we have three courses out right now and we're oh, we're going over that last in just okay. a moment. But you're going to refresh it again. Maybe the, okay. subscribe to his YouTube channel. We're about to check that here in just a moment. Um, the Mark course is the latest. Read Mark on Mark's terms with Dr. James D. Tabor. You cannot, Tabor, you can't miss out on this. If you haven't, you really should. Because so often we read Mark in light of Matthew and Luke and John. Scratch that. The ending on Mark oh. ends with the women were afraid. Do you need to take that? Do you want to call back? Call back. Um, the women were afraid. It doesn't have a birth narrative. Jesus was not born of a virgin, according to this gospel. So reading this as its own book is highly important. And that course, you can go sign up right now to give you a tease again. 4K, the course is in high quality. He takes you in Mark and through it. You walk away going, okay, I have never really read from beginning to end, let's say, the gospel of Mark. In this course, you will have done that. Now, we've teased the course. We've mentioned go subscribe and join. Check out our courses. We've got three of them out. Delcy Allison Jr., M. David Litwa, uh, James D. Tabor. Talked about the Patreon. I've got like 80 videos, maybe more. I'm like just throwing a number out there. So many that I need to edit and put on here with Dennis McDonald, Richard Carrier. Um, I've got... Dude, there's there's stuff that I've done with others that I haven't finished editing. Wow. Out. So please help. And then you, we need to grow this thing because you're going to be releasing your Dead Sea Scroll series. It's yep. not like you're asking for an arm and a leg. I hope not. I don't think so. I mean, that's less than a Starbucks coffee for the big thing, okay? Right. And uh, it is the most popular, so I'm going to join it. Anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> here we are on his uh, YouTube channel. We're about to refresh this joker. Right. But you have the exact amount. So I have the exact amount. All right. So oh, let's see how many subscribers we got. There we go. Okay. So we started with 7,012, 7, and now we have 7,047. That's 35. And guaranteed, yeah, if you're watching this later and it's not live, subscribe. Thank you. Yeah. This was fun. I want you to have a final... Final say to somebody like this fundamentalist in our chat named Digital oh. Hammurabi. Why should we trust Dr. Kip? <laughs> um, because I have a beard. That's a good Have a good reason. day, everyone. That was a great reason. I think that's sufficient. Um, wouldn't you say? Yes. And you know who doesn't have a beard? Was he this so called this guy, whoever doctor, Josh, whoever he is, Bowen, this doctor, whatever, Dr. Josh, he doesn't whatever. have a beard. No, he doesn't. So, your argument is if you start it's with having a beard, is truth, it's right. ironclad. It's We're beard presuppositionalists. 
then if he doesn't have a beard, yeah. he's automatically wrong. Yeah. And there's no convincing anyone otherwise because you have a beard and it's true. It's true. It's true. Man, we love you. Thank you, Dr. Josh, for that super chat. I still haven't figured out the foundational presuppositional existential metaphysical foundation of all reality and where to go from there. Um, see, I knew he was going to mock us. Typical atheist canard. Please stop <laughs> bullying us. Okay. <laughs> We're sick of it. We need to stand up for ourselves more. You know, we don't do this enough. We need to stand up for ourselves. Seriously. Love you. Thank you. Go in the description, check them out and don't miss this amazing intro outro on the Dead Sea Scrolls with Kip Davis. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Back in Washington, Kip Davis is getting his first look at a final prized fragment in the Museum of the Bible's collection. This is a fragment that contains text from Genesis chapter 32, and it's supposedly from the first century BC or the first century CE.